uh, the Paris Conference had the goal of establishing verifiable commitments to do something about the worst problem that humans have ever faced, the likely destruction of the possibility for organized human life. They couldn't do that. They could only reach a, 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 a non-verifiable commitment, promises, but not, 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 uh, uh, not fixed by treaty uh, and a, a real commitment. And the reason was that the Republican Congress in the United States would not accept binding commitments. So they were left with something much weaker and looser. The Morocco Conference intended to carry this forward by putting teeth in that loose, vague agreement. The conference opened on November 7th, normal way. Uh, November 8th, the World Meteorological Organization presented an assessment of the current state of what's called the Anthropocene, the new geological epoch that is uh, marked by radical human uh, uh, modification, uh, destruction of the environment that sustains life. November, November 9th, the conference basically ceased. Uh, the question that was left was whether it, it would be possible to carry forward this global effort to deal with the highly critical uh, problem of environmental catastrophe if the leader of the free world, uh, the richest and most powerful country in history, would pull out completely, as appeared to be the case. That's the stated goal of the president-elect, whose uh, regards climate change as a hoax and whose uh, policy, if he pursues it, is to maximize the use of fossil fuels, uh, end environmental regulations, dismantle the Environmental Protection Agency established by Richard Nixon, which is a measure of where politics has shifted to the right in the past generation, uh, and in other ways uh, accelerate the race to destruction. Well, that was essentially the end of the Marrakesh Conference. It terminated without any issue. Uh, so that might signal the end of the world, even if not quite in the intended sense. And in fact, what happened in Mar Marrakesh was a quite astounding spectacle. Uh, the hope of the world for saving us from this impending disaster was China, authoritarian, harsh China. That's where hopes were placed. At the same time, the, the leader of the free world, the richest, most powerful country in history, was acting in such a way as to doom the hopes to total disaster. It's an astonishing spectacle, and it's no less astounding that it received almost no comment. Uh, you can, something to think about. Well, the effects are quite real. Uh, COP21, the Paris negotiations, could not reach a verifiable treaty because of the refusal of the Republican Congress to accept binding commitments. The follow-up conference, COP22, uh, ended without any issue. Uh, we will soon see in the not very distant future even more dangerous, uh, horrifying consequences of this failure right here to come to term to, to address in a serious way this impending crisis. Uh, so say take uh, the country of Bangladesh. Uh, within a few years, uh, tens of millions of people will be fleeing from the low-lying coastal plains uh, simply because of the rise of sea level with the melting of the huge uh, Antarctic uh, glaciers much more quickly than was anticipated and the severe weather uh, associated with global warming. Uh, that's a refugee crisis of a kind that puts today's crisis, which is 
more a moral crisis of the West than an actual refugee crisis. It will put this current crisis into, a, a, it'll seem like a footnote to a, a tragedy. And it's uh, uh, the leading uh, climate ch scientist in Bangladesh has reacted by saying that these migrants should have the right to move to the countries from which all these greenhouse gases are coming. Millions should be able to go to the United States. And, and, uh, the United States and indeed the other rich countries that have grown wealthy, as we all have, while bringing this new geological epoch uh, bringing about this new geological epoch, epoch which uh, may well be the final one for the species. And the catastrophic consequences can only increase. Uh, just keeping to South Asia, uh, temperatures which are already intolerable for the poor uh, are going to continue to rise as the Himalayan glaciers melt also destroying the water supply for South Asia. Uh, in India already, um, 300 million people are reported to lack of water to drink, uh, uh, and it will continue both for India and Pakistan. And at this point, the two major threats to survival begin to converge. Uh, one is environmental catastrophe, the other is nuclear war, another threat that is increasing right before our eyes. Uh, India and Pakistan are nuclear states, nuclear weapons, states with nuclear weapons. They're all already almost at war. Uh, any kind of real war would immediately turn into a nuclear war uh, that might happen very easily over water short, over struggles over diminishing water supplies. A nuclear war would not only devastate the region, but might actually be terminal for the species if indeed it leads to nuclear winter and global famine, as many scientists predict. Uh, so the threats of survival to survival converge right there, and we're going to see much more like it. Meanwhile, the United States is leading the way to disaster, while the world looks for, to China for leadership. It's an incredible, astounding picture, and indeed only one piece of a much larger picture. MIT professor emeritus Noam Chomsky, world-renowned political dissident and linguist, speaking Monday night at Riverside Church as part of the celebration marking 20 years of Democracy Now! After a short break, we'll hear the conclusion of Chomsky's speech.